Hello, Culture Matters Podcast. I'm very tickled for this morning, excited to introduce you to our guest. Before I do that, here's a quote just for this episode. If you are the type of person that only cares about tomorrow, stop, live for today. If you're the type of person that only cares about themselves, only act selfishly. You're missing the joy, the selfish joy in sharing life with others. If you're the type of person that keeps waiting for when you're ready, you're never ready. If you're the type of person that doesn't care about important stuff, about business, success, you just want it all to be fun. Again, you're missing the fun and success, the fun that success generates. Phil Mancuso, El Presidente said that episode 349, season 30, also season 11, episode 126, season 19, episode 227. If you haven't listened to those episodes, get your ass over there after this episode. Our guest today, El Presidente himself, Phil Mancuso is back. Thanks for coming back on the Culture Matters podcast, my friend. Man, I was listening to that last episode at the end. I was like, oh, well, I got to say this. As you're reading, I'm like, boy, that's some smart person that was saying that. Yeah, that was the end of the last episode 349. Anyone that's listening, I'm like, get your ass over there. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, you know, I appreciate you. And, and, and I'm certainly happy to be doing this again. I always love having a conversation with you and and for that matter uh with anybody that sort of makes you scratch beneath the surface a bit and that's something you certainly do. Thank you my friend. And likewise uh, so for what what comes to mind when you hear yourself <laughs> The sage wisdom, as since the last time, so much has happened in the industry, in the yeah. world, in life. Yeah, I mean, look, in, in, I, mean, I think there's a few different elements to that. One is, it's, you know, it's kind of weird, right? And, and two is, you know, it, it, within that statement, um, trying to, I think J Jenna posted, Jenna was up at the house uh last month or whatever it was. And we cut some content and one of the posts that she put out was, you know, you know, something about, um, I forget the exact question, but it evoked an answer around, you know, spending versus savings, that sort of thing. And I'm like, you look, life's a gamble. If you save and you die young, you lost. If you spend and, and you live in, in, to an old age, you lost. You know, so everything's sort of in moderation, right? And and so, you know, in listening to that 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 quote about you know living life to its fullest, but but thinking about tomorrow and and you know enjoying the success. I, I mean, you know, there's there's you know, first of all, that's almost you know five different statements in one that 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 quote you know. Uh, some of them align, some of them, you know, juxtaposed against each other. I think at the end of the day, and it's also with what we're doing right now, and 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 I know that when when it comes to stuff like this, we kind of hate to date it, if you will. But yesterday, the Fed cut rates. Some viewed it as an emergency cut because the last time we got fifty was September of 07, right? Uh-oh, what do they know? But then here, you know, now all the everyone that that's sort of not in the know is like, oh, Fed cuts rates, rates are lower. I got news for you. We backed up yesterday and we're backing up again this morning because that whole thing about how you make money is speculation. The market front ran these cuts, sort of buy the, you know, rumors sell the fact in bonds, you you sort of sell the rumor, uh, you, you know, by the fact um, at times, you know, here we did buy the rumor in, in running rates down. Um, oftentimes, though, in bonds, it works in the opposite. Um, so, 
you know, like, you know, what, what, what is, what does all this mean? I've been very vocal about uh, w w the first part of that quote, I believe in business, which is sort of about delayed gratification, right? And, and, and being, being invested in the process mm. and, 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 and celebrating the, the wins, uh, albeit in moderation. And I, I was actually just sort of in a in, in a in a mini message board war uh, because I made sort of a statement. Uh, somebody posted, I have a borrower who I wanted to refi. They're saving a lot of money. But the borrower says, I'm going to wait a year. Rates are coming down. And everyone's sort of hating on that. Why? Because they want these originators want to do a loan because they've been starving. And I get that. Right. They also see because we see things as we want to see them through their lens, right? Well, they could do it again, but can they really? Adding these costs, or if it's a government loan, locking this borrower in for seven months because Ginny won't let you do a refi within 210 days of the last refi. The timing of refinancing these borrowers or refinancing yourself if you are a borrower is definitely far more delicate than we've historically given it credit to. You know, how many people have been habitual refires where um, had they just waited a little bit, they would have, they'd have been better off. But, but, or maybe and, as we sometimes like to say, there are times where one in the hand is worth two in the bush. And, you know, Jay, at the end of the day, that's the complexity. And I think this was also part of the quote. This is the complexity of success in life and business. There is no answer. There is no roadmap. There are no absolutes. Only a Sith deals in absolutes, <laughs> yeah. according to Obi-Wan. So, you know, consequently... You know, as my partner and, and and my friend, dear friend Eddie says, you know, we're trying, to, it's like baseball, you're trying to hit 300. You know, and, and, and I want to say we're trying to be more right than we are wrong. 300 isn't the case. It, you know, that's not the case. But, you know, you just want to be more right than you're wrong. And And I think ultimately that's what that quote represents, is try to be right more often than you're wrong. Take your losses in stride, respect the process, hate the losses, but not in a not in a destructive way, in a con constructive way that drives you to get better every day. Uh, if you were to distinguish between the behaviors of a deconstructive way of hating the losses versus a constructive way of hating the losses, where would that master class begin? Um, I think, so being at peace with yourself, right, um, perhaps on many different levels, spiritual and otherwise, but, you know, the, distinguishing between confidence and cockiness and arrogance and folks struggle with that. I don't know internally. I think externally, we always want to judge. Oh, he, you know, he, she, very cocky, Ari. I don't like that person. I think internally, few of us are are are, are knowingly, obnoxiously puffing the chest. Uh, th that exists. I don't say no, but but you know, I think I said this in one of our other shows, right? When you talk about pressure whether it be business related, life related, I like to equate it to sports. If I put a pitcher on the mound in front of 60,000 people and said, I want you to breathe, they would feel no pressure. It's second nature. We've taken whatever it is, you know, a hundred million breaths in our lifetime. I don't, if I say to you, Jay, take a breath, you don't have to, well, how do I do that? <laughs> you, you, you know, so you're going to do it. You're going to do it immediately and flawlessly. If I say, get this batter out. Well, 
that's something that you've had some success or end or failure with. So there's an immediate sort of hesitation, uh, even amongst the best of us. Okay. Who you're throwing that ball to adds a layer. The gravity of the situation adds a layer. And that is the funnel of life, right? As we call it at times in sports, the game gets too fast. If I say to you, throw a 40 mile an hour fastball to an infant, that's probably instinctual, as instinctual as taking a breath. 60 mile an hour to a all-star little leaguer, slightly more pause. 90 mile an hour fastball to a first round college, you know, anticipated first round draft drafty college player. One, you might say, shit, I don't know how to throw, I can't throw a 90 mile an hour fastball, but, but if you can, a little bit more pause. Aaron Judge at the plate, only very few rise to that occasion with feeling no pressure. But I think if you were to ask those people, it begins with practice. It begins with moderating your emotions. It begins with the repetition of, hey, you know, you look at what just happened where um, people have killed Garrett Cole for walking um, Rafi Devers because Rafi just absolutely rakes against Cole. And it's like Cole sort of, for lack of a better word, chokes, not because he's a different Garrett Cole than the guy that just attacked the batter before Rafi Devers. He's using history to be his guy, and he can't get Devers out. Mm -hmm. And Devers gets up there and rakes because he knows that he crushes Garrett Cole. Hmm. And so, you know, <clears throat> doing something you love, doing it over and over again, credibly, successfully, you know, I think that, that that's sort of a, a huge key to being able to repeat that success, having that confidence. And I think that that's the key to taking the L constructively. Mm. Hey, mm. this is a one-time thing. It's going to happen. I just have to win more than I lose. Versus, oh shit, there it is again. I stink, we stink, you stink. I don't know no. how to win. In the spirit of Munger, invert, always invert. Yes. If you were giving a, a lecture on, hey, this is how we'd be deconstructive as it relates to the L. How would, what would you? Well, you know, I've always been the sort of guy uh, that, that certainly looks for answers, asks for feedback. You know, you know, back in the day when we were, and, and, and look, I'm not suggesting that we would do it in this way nowadays, although we do do it in the form of NPS scores and stuff like that you know, uh, customer satisfaction on the internet, reviews, you know, even just simply calling them reviews. But we had a close when, when folks would go into the home, when we as human beings were more conversational and a bit less guarded and a bit more naive. You know, we would literally, I train new salespeople to literally close with on a scale of one to 10, one being that you're going to call the cops to get me out of here, 10 being you want to adopt me as your long lost son or daughter, whoever it might be that was doing the pitch. Like, what do you think about what we discussed tonight? Wow. And, and what they were trained for is if that answer was anything less than a 10, what do I need to do to get you to a 10? And almost invariably, it was almost never a 10. If it was a 10, great. So let me tell you how we do this, right? We, I need about 10, 15 minutes. We're going to have to, you know, X, Y, Z. Uh, and I would, I would be granular because I believe the so-called buyer's remorse, I felt like as a salesman, I never wanted to sell. I wanted to move you to a decision. 
okay, in a systematic, collaborative way, right? Where buyer's remorse comes from is 10 minutes when you're off the, after you're off the phone or out the door, it's like, whoa, what? What did I just do? So I would be, okay. Once I got them to a 10, either automatically or by virtue of, I was at a two, is a six, at an eight, now I'm at a 10, because I overcame the objection. Um, okay, 10, 15 minutes, we're gonna do this paperwork. I'm gonna get in my car, literally. I'm gonna get in my car. I'm gonna drive back to, to my house because you're my last appointment. I, I'm going to tidy up this paperwork. I'm going to submit it to my boss, Mark. Literally naming my boss, Mark, tomorrow morning. He's going to, you know, X, Y, Z. We're going to get it into this. You're going to get a call from my processor, Jay Duran, by 12 o'clock tomorrow morning. If he does not call you, reach out to me. Okay. Okay. I need you to get X, Y, Z together for me. Tax return, W, whatever. If I didn't leave with them. Now, by mind you, I prepped for the appointment to even say, hey, you know, have this stuff ready. But if I didn't have it, get this ready. Here's the fax number. Jay's going to ask for it. Be ready for that. We're going to order the appraisal tomorrow. If that appraiser doesn't call you within 72 hours, I want to know, LJ. And I would go step by step. Mm. Um, and that's why I had the, the lowest fallout uh, when I was selling on the team. There were no surprises. I didn't dupe anyone into a sale. Yet my close rate was second best most months behind Bill Carroll. And my 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 uh, close rate, uh, excuse me, my pull through rate was highest. Do you believe the pull through rate had a relationship with that communication flow between? If I understand you, I'm the sales totally total. customer. I'm I'm creating open feedback loops between me and the customer, so the customer is informing me if something drops. That then I'm you know as their partner, I'm getting on that or I'm getting on that. I'm, I imagine, I envision like a, like a, how would we draw it? You know, it'd be like, if there's a triangle, it was like, I'm at one point, they're at the other point adjacent for me. And at the top of the triangle is who's, what, who, what's ever next or whoever represents that. Yeah. You said processor appraiser as an example, like each piece, you'd be communicating proactively with the customer. Let yes. me know about this. Let me know about that. Is that the case? A hundred percent. You know, I mean, look, the mind races. It's really almost um, over. It's like uh, common sense, but uncommon. Einstein. Well, well common yeah. sense is uncommon sense. Yeah. I mean, I mean, look, I had this conversation just last week. Love this. Just last week with an Uber driver who was taking me to the airport to get to aim fuse. Okay. Oh, you still use those <laughs> from time to time, from time, from time to time. And this the is pain, a really pain, like a say again, I could feel the pain. Uh, just it's projection. <laughs> I usually drive myself there, but this was one where I did, you know, I leave the car or something, but, but this is one where I did it. And super interesting dude. He was like a, a life coach and I get in the back of his car and he has this placard with his name and I won't name him. I had a really interesting name, by the way. And it said that he had autism, which meant that he either spoke too much or not at all. So now think about this right then and there. OK, if he doesn't speak at all. What is the reaction of the average person? What's wrong with this guy? If he speaks too much. What's the reaction? Oh, you know, dude, shut the fuck up, right? But now I'm disarmed. And I can regulate and manage the relationship. If, if, if I am now, and this is something, you know, I got from you, right? The burden is on the most aware, right? He's the most aware of his situation. But now I am, right? And I can regulate or manage the, the relationship the way I see fit. 
And, and so I said, well, you know what? I'm not a talker and he might not talk, right? So if we're, if neither of us are talking, we're on cloud nine. If he's talking too much, if this is his condition, I now am disarmed to say, hey, I'm not sure if I have autism or not, but I hate talking. And I know that sometimes you don't like talking either. So are we cool with not talking? Absolutely. But we both talked, so that was cool too. And we were talking about people's behavior because he coaches people's, you know, behavior. And, you know, j- just, just about the benefit of communication and at times over communication, you know, um, it's, it's, I think that, and this is all intertwined, the more confident that you are in your product, your ability, the people that you work with, the more vulnerable you are in your communication, Mm. the less likely that there are any surprises on either side of things, the less likely you have a blow up. The mind races, uh, why, why are you five minutes late? If I don't have equity with you, like I was a couple of minutes late to our call. If I don't have equity with you, Right away, it's this doesn't matter to him. He's gonna he he's gonna can he's gonna cancel. He's gonna miss. The best of us, those thoughts sort of creep in. But if I have equity, this is whatever it is, our fourth one, right? And you kind of know that I'm, you know, maybe a busy guy in the mornings are busy. You're just like, ah, he's running a little behind. I have a question about this. Um, going back, I'm ima- I'm visualizing you sitting, you know, with a customer, uh, you know, early on and having that conversation. I say early on because in the context of that relationship today, it's just a different context, different, different yeah. person, different avatar. But I imagine you sitting there asking those, those, those clarifying questions. So you're on the same page. So there's that partner, the spirit of the partnership. And then I imagine if I'm looking, visualizing that triangle, you know, uh, how would we say that? Like, you, uh, you know, a triangle, there's one point and then adjacent is the other point. And then there's the tip of the triangle. So if the customer's at one point, you're at one point, and the tip is, well, what's next? And then I'm thinking who? So it's like, you said the thing about the processor and then you said the thing about the appraiser and you're communicating, flowing with the customer. And it's like a t- perfect triangle that, that you add triangles to it. Okay. Then I had this thought. I want your thoughts on sales. If I'm what I'm, I'm a salesperson, I'm a distributor of information that the customer otherwise doesn't have. That's the power dynamic. So the, I have something they don't have. From an information standpoint, they have something I might like or don't have, which is capital. So that's the dynamic of that relationship. But then a thought came to my mind. In an organization, it's actually opposite. Um, We have capital they don't have, and the people have information we don't have. So that dynamic shifts. And I know that's, you know, fairly black and white or, you know, uh, binary, but there's a distinction between the... um, us, you know, let's say organization to customer versus organization to to internal people. What are your thoughts? Or if we can un, you know, I don't have yeah. it quite, but I'm pulling at a string. Like the the so, dynamic of us sitting in the house with that customer, we we might be more informed to them. Now, part of sales is not running them over because ultimately they have to trust that we're our selfish desires aren't um we're not abusing the information we have that they don't have and just taking advantage of them so that's that art of building trust building rapport them liking us giving us permission to lead that relationship so yeah we have information they don't have they have capital we don't have in the employer employee dynamic the employer has capital the employee doesn't have uh and 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 enough information 
to think it has all the information. That's kind of, but the employee has information that the employer doesn't have. So that dynamic shifts. What are your thoughts? Yeah. You so, so a couple different, and I want to write something down here, right? Uh, um, I've never quite thought of it in this way, but this is like just popping in my head as we're talking. So, so sort of, I want to give you a, a small answer and then, and then really revert back to a bigger answer, right? So the, the, the short answer from a tactical, a blocking and tackling standpoint, I have two principles when it comes to employment. One is there's no such thing as, a, and, I, and I've said this before, I don't know if, if on, on one, one of your podcasts. In my mind, there's no such thing as a bad employee. You either hired the wrong person, you put them in the wrong position, or you didn't give them the tools to succeed. Full stop. Person, Period. Position, tools. person, position, tools. Right wrong here. person, didn't give them the tools, didn't put them in the right position. Period. I don't believe that any human inherently wakes up in the morning and says, I want to fail today. They simply don't know how to succeed at varying levels, zero to 100. And you're going to have employees that know how 100% how to succeed autonomously or otherwise. And then you're going to have employees that have no fucking clue. And they may or may not become great employees if they are the right person and you give them the tools and you manage them properly. And this is the bigger answer. And it goes back to the conversation I had with that Uber driver that I am fully aligned with and have explored uh, outside of that conversation previously. And I've talked about Pavlov's dog as it relates to salespeople. If you get a hundred no's, it's, it's, it's just human instinct to stop asking. Because you're you, you the supposition is the next ask is a no. And this 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 guy just absolutely guys like I, I wanna I wanna stop the car and give you a high five. Instinctually, as humans, we have a survival instinct. Not quite, I don't want to say it in the context of fight or flight, but but there is there's that element, right? And it's much easier to fly than, than, than it is to, to fight, okay? So when it comes down to business, this is all about we are programmed as humans to not succeed. Full stop. Instinctually, we are programmed to survive. And he used an example of a saber-toothed tiger. And he argues that we're still effectively out there looking out for the saber-toothed tiger, right? And, and that's why a lot, you know, people didn't see the internet coming into this. You know, we're looking at that sort of at, as AI right now. And is it a threat? And is it not a threat? And we're still looking for saber-toothed tigers. And, and, and so, you know, at the end of the day, the most successful humans learned how to navigate a world in which saber-toothed saber tigers existed, not to per perpetually run from them, to maybe draft or hunt behind them, maybe hunt them, maybe build higher ground to get away from them rather than per per perpetually being on the run. Necessity being the mother of invention. And so in a destructive way, we're, 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 we're perpetually running. And the most successful people lean in. Face first. Despite our better, you know, our, our better thought to not do that. Um, the other principle that I have in employment is from a blocking and tackling aspect is an employer must have leverage over an employee. Otherwise it's chaos. And that leverage comes in one of a few forms. You either need to overpay that employee relative to the market. 
you need to over benefit that employee relative to the market. You know, more more vacation pay, better health insurance. Like, you know, we think of benefits like, you know, as oh, what, health insurance. No, it could be a better 401k match. It could be better benefits. It could be more time off. It could be, um, you know, off the beaten path, things like trips and, 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 you know, flat screen TVs and gold watches, whatever, but just, just something that other companies aren't doing or aren't doing as well as you, or the last thing is accountability. You know, you, you can underpay, under benefit, so on and so forth, but then not hold people accountable. There has to be a reason keeping somebody there, right? Otherwise, it's anarchy. Otherwise, they don't respect the job. It's 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 just now they're here because they're afraid to leave. Social security. And those are never going to be great employees, ever. They might be good. They might be okay somewhere in the belly, plus or minus good. Certainly, that's where your worst employees live. And then I've got a dirty secret for you. You can't overpay your best employees if you're overpaying your worst employees. And how that's can, where companies fail. How can it? What are your thoughts on accountability? How can I hold people responsible if I'm not res responsible? Well, you can't, but I don't know who, who the who the you is. I mean, you know, a gentleman. I just think accountability the the um, the the theme of accountability in our culture today, business culture at large, is an oxymoron. It's it's backwards. It's like accountability is a consequence of personal responsibility. And as I, yeah, I would love your thoughts on that. Yeah, an old partner used to say it this way: "The fish thinks from the head down," and it's always that way. It's invert, always invert. Right. The problem is this. And why I say who is the who? If the who is somebody beneath you in, in you know in the hierarchy of the business, or is like we like to say it is in EPM above us, because because you know, ownership is the basement, executive management is sort of the basement, if you will. Um, look, if if the ultimate decision maker shareholder, owner, CEO, president, whatever that title may be. If the ultimate decision maker is broken, the business long run can and will never succeed. Apple is a great example of that, right? I want I want your opinion on this. Okay. Like, like try to poke, if you can post some holes in it. I, I, I'm of the belief at this juncture that accountability is given in speech or taken in force, people quit or they get fired. Responsibility is modeled in behavior. So it's like Locke's empiricism, model, you know, the five senses, responsibility. Accountability is given in speech, taken in force or represented in force. And I think that our Western society's success um, hinges on this. So if you could try to unpoke some holes in that or maybe, you know, make it no, better. No, no, no. Yeah, I love that quote. Because I don't believe it's a dogma. I'm just trying to, how can this simply, because the accountability conversation draw, start has begun in the last 10 years, driven me up a wall because um, it seems, it's an oxymoron to even discuss. It. It's, a, yeah. So I'll just repeat for the audience, accountability is given in speech or take you know taken in force leave or hey i'm leaving responsibility is modeled in behavior and they have a relationship there's an inter iterative interactive relationship based on hierarchies social hierarchies that's why peterson's work really outlines this eloquently if you really dig in there but so that's my uh the uh i guess proposition that i'm yeah well i mean you're talking about i mean i i, I mean simply put you're talking about perhaps the most basic formula to success, 
life success, business success, um, relationship success, right? From the from this day, and this is how I read this, or and or would explain that quote, right? In 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 perhaps more layman terms. You know, it said, show me someone's incentives and I'll sh show you their behavior. That's the responsibility piece of it. If 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 you're incented to run rough shot, if if I am the leader. And, and you're incented in a way that allows you to run roughshod over me. It's going to be nearly impossible for you to resist that temptation. Nearly. Overwhelmingly, my our relationship will fail if I set you up from a behavioral standpoint, a responsibility standpoint, to be irresponsible. So I say to you, Jay. Okay, your responsibility as a loan officer is to do loans. Well, shit, I'm leaving to interpretation, essentially. I, I got to do loans at all costs, good, bad, or indifferent. I'm going to do fraudulent loans. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm going to do loans whether or not we make money. I'm going to do loans whether they run in direct conflict to the bigger interests of the business. If I say to you, Jay, we need to make a profit. Your behaviors are gonna be different. If I say to you, Jay, our goal is always to do the right thing by our borrowers your behaviors might be different. The right thing by EPM, your behaviors might be different. And your incentives, your comp is directly correlated to those missives. It doesn't have to be a singular thing. I'm over, you know, it could be that our goal is to make a, our mission is to make a profit by doing, you know, one loan perfectly that is in the best interest of our borrower. You know, for example, the, that shapes your behavior. So the values sh de de start developing parameters. So the person isn't stuck in the maze. They get to the other side of the maze and it's value created. Correct. You're, so, you're, you're saying the um, show incentives and I'll show you the behavior that they like, I just want to make sure I follow. Do loans, very opaque, you know, leaves many things to be determined by each individual's subjectivity yes but it's do loans that this you know the 10 command you know this 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 now we're getting into the values system and culture, Here's the culture the culture which starts shaping the identity of the organization and what it tolerates what it doesn't tolerate and that starts to that you're saying that that has an influence on responsibility 100% because then it goes back to communication as well. If we're clear, so 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 ultimately, I don't have to take anything by force if we're clear and aligned on the objective, right? And and I think where we get tripped up is the objective. We're not clear out of fear. I so want to hire you, Jay, that I'm not going to I'm not going to tell you the full story because I'm afraid you won't like that. I so want to transact this business with you, Jay, that I'm going to withhold information that um that I should be delivering because I'm afraid of the consequences because my job is to get you to sign on the line which is dotted. But if I said to you, John Jane Doe, your job is to make Jay the happiest guy he's ever been, the most success. Your job is to never run in opposition of Jay. Well, well, not only am I not afraid to say something that might kill the, the deal. 
I'm incentivized to say it. Jay, I got to be honest with you. I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't. And then I say, I come back and I say, and Phil says to me, well, why did you, what, what happened? Why didn't you get the deal from Jay? It wasn't right for him. Oh, great. Great job. Great job. Because the, 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 the goal wasn't to sell the deal. The goal was that Jay means something to us. Whether we have a relate again, this is not about relationship, right? It's about how you value your, you as a customer, if, if, I, if our goal is customer first, you as a customer me, are, mean everything to me, whether I know you or not. If, if that, that's the value that we're sort of proposing in this example, right? So the, yeah, the customer's responsibility because they lack information that we have will be on will it be increased or decreased based on our accountability to them our responsibility yes which is yeah, has a relationship if, with sharing of information and if you have communication the, yes and if you have the confidence in believing that you've built the better mousetrap i've always argued that i have found i am comfortable in letting people walk away when I believe that I'm 100% right, right in, in, in the product, in the service, in the pitch, in the mechanics, in the proposal, I have found our best customers have come from the folks who have walked away. Let them see that the grass isn't green. By our employees. My best employees have always been the ones that have left and come back. They found out for themselves that the grass wasn't green. And I let them, oftentimes painfully, go find that out and then benefited when they came back. And, and, and again, to really sort of, I would be able to in detail, in a communicative way, say, Look for this. Look for this. Do you realize this? And then it would be, you were right. You were right. And we covered this ground in a, in, in, in a previous podcast where, you know, I talked about how in a previous life we did business, you know, a, a call center business on bankrate.com. Highly, highly competitive. And, you know, we put out an ad and maybe there on this particular day, our rates, you know, we would be the fifth lowest rate. And then the phone would ring. And like, look, in a vacuum, why would anybody do business with the fifth best, you know, lender, the fifth best rate, if, if, if the measure is right? So many reasons. Right, right. But so many reasons, right? An infinite amount of rationalizations. Correct. And it was my job, and therefore my, my LO's job, they were trained to know as many of those reasons. Wait, you proved it earlier. Only the Sith has absolutes. Right. So I knew that number one couldn't do that rate. And they just threw it out there and they couldn't handle the volume of calls. And I would say, hey, you know what? And I, again, knowing the answer, never ask a question. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, never ask a question if you don't know the shot, right? You know, why didn't you call Jay Duran Mortgage, right? Uh, what happened? They didn't pick up the phone. Yeah, I got you know, got a voicemail, right? You know, why didn't you call up Eddie Perez Mortgage? What happened? Did they tell you? Yeah, I could do that rate, and they were a broker at the time. Yeah, not not literally Eddie Perez Mortgage. You know, uh, you, you know what 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 happened? Did they say that? Um, you you know, because I knew that they were a broker. Uh, you know, when they say that they could offer you that rate, but that really wasn't their best lender. But their best lender was only a quarter percent higher. Yeah, that's what they said to me. You know, and why, you know, what happened with lender three? Was it, they didn't have an office in Oregon? No, no, they didn't. I'm really, I'm not comfortable with that. Okay, great. Let me tell you about what we do. You know, I'm going to get you to a local rep. And or I'm going to get you, you know, we're, you know, we're not a broker and this rate is real and whatever it might have been. Right. Or we are a broker, but I've advertised the lender that I've deemed most credible, whether or not they had the lowest rate. 
And then I've built instant credibility because going back to that hard work, there's no substitute, builds confidence, builds repetition, builds credibility, builds courage. For and then all two, of a sudden, yes. I, I want to pose these two, this dichotomy for part two. And then if you can just surmise this, summarize this for our audience, take away what they could do with those 50 bips. <laughs> <laughs> so number one, never ask in context of, let's say salesperson to customer, never ask a question you don't know the answer to. Context two, employer to employee, never ask a question you know the answer to. It flips. Or else, if one is wants to be uh, surrounded by I love that thoughtful, brilliant, better people, I love that. I go, well, that, I just never thought of it that way until you said because this is what I was trying to scrape. I love earlier, to create autonomy and individual sovereign. You know, like how do you get surrounded by awesome, smart, autonomous Dude, human beings? That it's, is at some point it flips. At some point that is great because how obnoxious. And I'm trying to explore that in this podcast, but right by having everybody, my mom came on, she's coming back, you know, people that we work with, obviously, and, then, and then strangers and everybody that is like, never ask a question that I know the answer to is how I'm, 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 you know, grow, maturing as a person, a husband and future father, but, but from an, an organizational standpoint, at some point, I think it flips where we go from sales to leadership and uh, for part two, we can continue the conversation. Yeah, there is no think there. At some point, it absolutely flips. Phil, what, uh, <laughs> and I meant this like tongue in cheek, but yeah, what, in closing, if you could give us a summary for today and then I'll tell everybody, look, look out for part two. This is a definitely a part two conversation. And then, uh, yeah, what can I do with my 50 bips? What, what, <laughs> um, so, I think in summary, right, if you're watching this and, and the question is, why am I not successful, right? And knowing Jay, most people that 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 he, he engages with or is watching his stuff are successful people. But, but if your question is, why am I not successful or how can I be more successful or dare I say, why am I successful? There are a ton of very successful people that have no real idea why. It just sort of happened, right? I, I think that, you know, in a lot of ways, it begins and ends with the counter move. And we talked about this in a, in a previous podcast. The counter move in sports is the magic move. Starting to move forward while you're still moving backward creates physical separation of muscle, that, that stretch, which creates, you know, a, a, a catapulting like, a multiplying like effect. In life and business, that counter move is delayed gratification, resist the marshmallow which the industry is doing a terrible job at right now. They want to rush, rush a refinance boom that, in my opinion, is two, three months or more away, okay? Um, the, the, the counter move is, again, that programming of survival versus success. Sounds the same, very different. Successful people succeed they don't survive to risk is directly correlated to reward we talked about bonds traders front run the rally the sell-off how much money are you going to make if i say to jay hey yeah the fed lowered rates yesterday go do this too late so you might make some money you might survive you're not going to succeed. And so fight that instinct to survive. Yeah. Embrace that, that, that counter instinct 
to succeed. That to me, those two things are really the main drivers. Wrap that in a cadence of 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 of, of self help, of 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 getting better, of constructively dealing with failure. Um, what do you do with the fifty basis points? Um, so, uh, look, I'll say it this way. Um, you can't make a good deal with a bad person, Warren Buffett. All right. Um, someone said, I don't know who, um, that your first loss is your best loss. That's been a principle that has guided me for 25, 30 years not since the beginning of my professional career, but early on, you, you, you know, um, to, to the point of there are nearly infinite reasons why you wouldn't do business with the cheapest price, right? Most of those reasons fall under the umbrella of your first loss is your best loss. If my, if, if by not bottom feeding, it costs me, I'm just going to throw a number out, you know, a thousand dollars, but I get better advice, a better lo loan, a lifelong relationship. Yeah. Loan number two is faster, easier, cheaper, better. The loan number one actually does what it says it's going to do. Why? Because here's what I find when you buy the cheapest, either it's not real or it's a razor thin deal. And when stuff goes wrong and it almost invariably, if, you, if you're the myriad of unlucky people where it doesn't go right, overwhelmingly it goes wrong, few times it goes right, now they begin to nickel and dime you. And when folks get nickel and dimed, it almost always becomes more expensive. And so now it's more frustrating it takes longer and it costs you more. It's profound because it, that just goes back to on an individual level, that human is living in, if we use your terminology, survival, not success. 100%. On an individual level. And then now it's opportunity costs. How much have they lost in opportunity? Oh, well, of course they have because they have no purpose and they're not winning at their career or blah, 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 which led them to go the cheapest route in the first place. Yeah, and dude, Jay, have the humility, right? And this is the invert part, is, you know, if if I'm coming to you for culture, right? It, it, I'm very proud of my very high rate because I can not only pay it, pay it well. <laughs> right, right, right. I fucked the whole uh, barbecue up, <laughs> you know, to stand on the top of the, whatever, I'll find it, the highest thing I could stand on. <laughs> Everyone, this is my rate, how we're paying for it. We've done this. We've done that. We didn't do this. Low yeah. DTI. Low DTI. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, you're man, I'm so upset. We we got to end this show. We got to do part two. Let me just say this before we end Next it. your time. Yeah. If, if I'm engaging you for culture, which we do, right? The connotation is that you know bet more about culture than we do. Shame on us if I find the cheapest person who knows the least about culture, right? See, let me think, look, if I break it down and let me just say this again, because we all know. I have a, a couple, <laughs> although that's a little mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but, 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 you know, I, I know that we all know, you watching this know this answer, right? So it Thank sounds you. stupid for me to say it, but then do we really know the answer? If yeah. I hire Jay, to help my culture, but I knowingly hire the worst J because he's the cheapest. Then, 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 then why? I'm hiring him because I don't have the answer and I'm hiring somebody who maybe knows the answer less than I do or slightly more. Why pay for it? It's, it's mindless, it's senseless. And we do that over and over and over again in our lives. Where I spend my money is in buying a product or service 
that solves a problem, a need that I can't solve. I can't make this shirt as well as G4. Hence, I pay for it. Hence, if I want a shirt that's a step up from a t-shirt, then price doesn't matter. Otherwise, I just buy a cheap, buy a t-shirt, a 50 cent t-shirt and wear it proudly. And that's why we hired Jay Duran, the culture man. And Here's Jay, an ad. I, I, I wrote this down on my last page of notes. I got 11 pages of notes. You make me smarter when I talk to you. Thanks, Phil. Stop it. Stop yeah, it. I wrote it down. I wrote it down. You you make me smarter when I talk to you. Uh, please, if you're listening to this episode, go to um, 227 season 19. Go to episode 126 season 11, episode 349 season 30. And you're going to hear very different conversations from our guest, Bill Mancuso, El Presidente. This is uh, so much fun. I, I can't wait for part two. I got my notes. I have more questions than I had before I came in. And we will see you all. Thank you, brother, for doing this. Leave us a review on the Culture Matters podcast, and we will see you next time. Thanks, buddy. Go to El Presidente underscore EPM on Instagram. If you like business stuff, wine, golf, life. Follow Phil. We will see you next time on the Culture Matters podcast.